So illustrator and cartoonist Michael Cho, whose work has graced covers for Marvel and DC Comics, is here to discuss um, comics and making graphic novels and his debut graphic novel, Shoplifter. Shoplifter tells the story of a young woman's search for meaning, happiness, and self-fulfillment as she works as a millennial urban professional. She dabbles in small-time shoplifting uh, as a means of coming to terms with her conflicting emotions. And Mike is joined in conversation with Chip Kidd, a four-time Eisner award-winning designer, author, and editor of graphic novels at Pantheon Books. Now, I'm told that they beatboxed and rapped at Comic-Con, so I'm hoping if we give them enough of a welcome, they'll reprise that for us tonight. So give it up for Mike and Chip. So, hello everybody. Uh, we're thrilled that you are here. We were worried that we were going to outnumber you. <laughs> so thank you that that, that has not happened. Uh, my name is Chip Kidd. I'm um, uh, tonight. My my role is as editor at large for graphic novels for uh, Pantheon Books, and we are very uh, pleased and honored to publish. Um, Mr. Michael Cho's uh, graphic novel, Shoplifter, which just came out several weeks ago. And um, I became aware of Michael's work five or six years ago, actually, through, um, through a trade magazine called Illo, um, which is short, short for illustration, um, as opposed to being sick. Um, <laughs> and um, I was... I was blown away by his work. Um, and, and then, apropos of nothing, like two or three years later, I was asked to write a, a Batman and Robin short story for DC Comics for a, an anthology series called Batman Black and White. And, and um, the brief was to do an eight-page story in black and white featuring, featuring Batman. But other than that, it could be whatever I wanted. And, and I, I said to my editor at DC Comics, I said, there's this guy named Michael Cho. And um, you probably haven't heard of him, but I think he's the one to draw it. And they said, you are correct, and let's give it a shot. And, and so we did, and then um, that was a tremendously uh, fun and, and amazing project to, to work on, and you'll see a little bit of that. And then um, I heard from Michael that he actually had a graphic novel that he wanted to publish, uh, an original story with original characters. And, um, um, and, and I was totally excited and blown away by that too, and so we, we published it about a month ago, uh, debuted about a month ago, and um, also de debuted on the um, New York Times bestseller list uh, for graphic novels at number six. And so we're very, very excited about that. And so, um, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Cho, he's going to uh, present his work to you. We're gonna talk about it and then, uh, and then do some Q&A. So there you go. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it's really great to see the crowd here. Uh, are you all like comic fans? Can you raise? Okay. Yay, comics. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about comics. Um, but first, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Uh, as the slide says, I am an illustrator and cartoonist. And uh, I was born in South Korea but I moved to Canada at the age of six, and I currently live in Toronto, so I'm an East Coast kid. Um, but when I was growing up in Korea, uh, my favorite thing as a kid was giant robot cartoons. And uh, so when I was about four or five years old, my mom asked me, uh, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And I told her, when I grow up, I want to build a giant robot and take over the world. <laughs> Which didn't seem implausible at the time. And then uh, later on, when I moved to Canada and I got more into comics, like any visually attuned kid, uh, I changed my mind and said, I want to be a cartoonist. And then 
Uh, when I was about 11, I went to a Saturday afternoon art class because my mom just wanted to get me the heck out of the house. And uh, there I saw a woman who was working as an illustrator. and I didn't know what that was, but uh, when she explained what she does, uh, I was just absolutely fascinated. And I changed my mind again, and I said, I want to be an illustrator. And then when I was about 16, I got into fine art, and I was doing a lot of oil paintings and studying what I considered real art. Uh, and I decided I want to be uh, a fine artist. So I went to art college, and uh, there I, uh, I learned to paint. And when I got out, I was exhibiting as a painter, so I was working as a fine artist. And then eventually I had to eat something other than ramen noodles. So I, <laughs> I, I started working as an illustrator, which paid better than having giant canvases sitting in my parents' garage. Uh, so I worked as an illustrator. And then after a while, I, I started working in, in comics and cartoons. So I've kind of gone down the list again of all my childhood goals from being a painter to, uh, you know, to an illustrator to cartoonist. So the only thing really left is for me to uh, build a giant robot and take over the world, uh, which apparently requires more physics and science training than I have. I think if Chip and I worked on it together, we might come up with a really good looking robot, it just wouldn't move and <laughs> conquer the world. Uh, but as I say, going back uh, into talking about comics, uh, I was, when I came to Canada, I was looking for giant robot comics and I was shocked to find that they didn't have that. And it, you know, it was heartbreaking for me. But they did have Iron Man. So uh, he was the closest thing to giant robots, and uh, I got into him very early, and I actually learned to read somewhat from reading comic books, and it taught me some things about English, so I, I learned Excelsior really early in life. <laughs> and, uh, uh, this is the very first uh, Iron Man comic I ever read, and I actually remember panels of this thing vividly, and it has a, a guest appearance by uh, Muhammad Ali, which is cool enough on its own. But then Iron Man also fights these guys in power suits, and it's, you know, it's extra cool. So, uh, as I say, though, I am a child of 80s Marvel comics. So uh, this was the very, uh, this was my absolute favorite comic when I was like 11. And uh, it's an X-Men comic. Does anyone recognize this comic? I just want to see. Okay, okay, so, oh, so yeah, good, this, okay. this just says you're old. Right, because you know, you show this to like the kids these days, and they're like, "We want Gambit," you know. And so this was my favorite when I was uh, like 11 or 12. But eventually, uh, I got into other kinds of comics, uh, like this one, uh, which is obviously Love and Rockets by the Hernandez brothers. And um, this series was really important to me because uh, when I was leaving comics at that time because you hit that age that's it's sort of it's sort of a natural progression for a lot of artists and then um, I discovered Love and Rockets and I realized that uh, you could use comics to tell all kinds of stories and that uh, from there I learned that comics were not uh, a genre they were a medium by which you could express anything and it really gave me the impetus to try and create some of my own comics. And then I also got into comics like this one, where I discovered uh, the work of Charles Burns for the first time, who is just a fantastic artist. And again, this one, uh, Raw, was particularly influential because it showed me that you could make art through comics, that it wasn't necessarily just a, a narrative storytelling field, but there were a lot of ways to play with the juxtaposition of words and images. Was, was this also your first um, uh, encounter of the work of Art Spiegelman? Yes, yes, yes. That's right, and I think Richard McGuire is in this one as well. It okay. might be, that's where here. The, in this the, issue. It might be in this issue, because for some reason you can find this issue in a lot of bookstores. Like they must have printed a lot more. They must have had more money that, for this one. Power of Penguin. Oh, is that what it was? Yep. Uh -huh, okay. <clears throat> and then I got into books like this. Um, this is an adaptation of City of Glass by, uh, by David Maz Kelly, it was just brilliant. And uh, it's an adaptation of a Paul Auster novel into comics form without being slavish to the uh, source material and just being a literal uh, movie on paper version of a novel. Uh, and it showed me that uh, you could adapt things into comics into that format without, uh, without making it slavish, but rather have, play with all the, the essential elements that only comics can do 
So, and it's also drawn by Maz Kelly, and, and, and he's just a fantastic influence on me because he straddles all fields. He's a guy who could uh, be the best superhero Batman artist in the world, and you'll appreciate that. Mm. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, go off and do his own personal material, and it showed me that you know, the stuff I loved as a child didn't necessarily have to go away in order for me to produce other types of comics that you could be, you could dabble in both fields. The, the other thing I'll say real quickly about this um, adaptation is if, um, if you've ever read Paul Auster's City of Glass, uh, which is an amazing book, you, you, I couldn't imagine no. ever no. trying to adapt yeah. it as, as, as a comic book, yeah. basically. And uh, what um, the the, adap the adapter uh, uh, Paul Karasek is the writer and 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 David Mazzucchelli, what they achieved here was truly extraordinary. Yeah. There are sequences in this book that are that can only work as an investigation of like language, spoken language, and yet they come up with visual metaphors and a, a very clear comics. This is what comics does really well. It clarifies things, you know, into visual form. And they take very, very um, theoretical concepts about syntax and yet translate it into comic panels involving a man in a boat and a drain and things like that. And it, it's just brilliant. It, you know, it opened my eyes. And I also got into comics like this uh, by one of my very favorite artists, uh, Dan Klaus. This is the very first Dan Klaus book I ever read. Have, do I, are you guys familiar with his work? Raise your hands if you are. Okay, good, I'm, t I'm, I'm preaching to the converted, okay? So uh, this was like my favorite uh, comic when I found it and it just suddenly opened my eyes again. Uh, there's a story in this book called uh, Blue Italian Shit that is, uh, when I read it, it broke my heart and at the same time made me laugh and it was black as hell and, and at the same time incredibly smart and uh, humane and uh, you know in, in all in I think it was eight pages or ten pages and it showed me his particular genius. Uh, but as I say I, I've worked mostly in my adult life as an illustrator and uh, I've painted book covers, I've uh, done editorial illustration, done concept illustration, than the occasional advertising assignment. And, uh, and this is a book cover I painted for, uh, for Penguin Classics edition for Don DeLillo's White Noise. Uh, it was art directed by Paul Buckley, who is a fantastic art director. And uh, when they contacted me for this job, I was actually reading Libra, another Don DeLillo book at the time, so I, was, I thought it was a joke, you know? And, uh, and they, uh, they told me that um, uh, DeLillo had picked me over somebody else. And I was like, I was floored, and I asked them, well, can I talk to him? And they said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, we don't talk to him much, he communicates by fax. So, uh, so when I got this assignment, I had been painting a few book covers before, and uh, I, was, I asked them, okay, so what do you need on it? Do you need blurbs on the back? What are the pull quotes? Where's the Oprah's book club sticker go? And, you know, and uh, they said, no, you don't get it. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, you get to decide everything. And I said, so what? Like, what do you actually need on this? And they said, we need the title, we need DeLillo's name, and we need the UPC code, and the Penguin logo. The rest is up to you. And uh, I had never had that degree of freedom before, so I pushed it and I said, so what if I want to do French flaps? And that's what the side illustrations are. And they said, yeah, go for it. I said, well, what if I want to emboss this thing and, and actually not do type on the back, which is what this is? And they said, uh, yeah, if you just want to make that emboss, that's cool. And then I said, what about if I want gold leaf on this thing? <laughs> you know, and, and they said, if you really want gold leaf, and I said, I'm just kidding, right? So, but it, it taught me a really valuable lesson, which is uh, whenever someone gives you power, don't give it back, right? <laughs> just abuse it, and use as much of it as you can. <laughs> so, this is another book cover I did for the Best American Comics Anthology. Uh, it's for the 2010 edition, obviously. And this one was edited by Neil Gaiman. Uh, and I have a story in here, and they, when they asked me to do the cover, I was completely honored, and I said, uh, so I, I was thinking about what I would do for this, and usually for anthologies, the, the cover that immediately springs to mind as an idea is 
happy comic fun land I describe it as, where everybody's reading comics and you know there's a little kid that's reading manga and there's an old man reading Peanuts and there's a grown up reading uh, Mouse or Spawn. I don't know, and uh, and everybody gets along, you know. And uh, I just was thinking, I just want to do something the complete opposite of that. What could be the furthest thing from that? So I decided I would do a, a book burning, you know, and uh, make it uh, oblique whether or not the boy was saving things from the pile or adding things to the pile. And you could see a, a bunch of comics being burned here. Like this is. Uh, All Star Batman, I think, uh, issue one, and there's shame a shame on you. <laughs> there's an issue of Scott Pilgrim here. There's Jimmy Corrigan over there. He's saving a Wolverine comic, a, the Love and Rockets comic that I just showed, and the Yoshihiro Tatsumi biography, which is just a brilliant book. So uh, this is not an indictment on any of those books or anything, because you don't know whether they were being burned purposely or whether he's trying to save them. Uh, but I painted other book covers, and this is a, a, a two of five book covers I painted recently for a Canadian publisher called House of Anansi, and they put out a line of, uh, of Canadian reprints every year. Uh, they pick five or, or six books, and then they hire one illustrator to do all the covers for these Canadian classics reissues. And uh, when they contacted me, uh, uh, you know, again, I was honored to do the job, and. Um, the previous year's covers have been drawn by uh, Jillian Tamaki, who is just a phenomenally talented illustrator. So I was like, I gotta bring the A game, uh, you know. And uh, so uh, with these, I was aiming to do each cover completely differently, based on <clears throat> my readings of the tones of the book, and not have anything that was uh, unified stylist stylistically. I wanted it to look like the work of you know, five different illustrators. So um, on, the, on the different rounds of these, like how many of each one would you uh, present? That's, that's it. That's it. Yeah, so I, I just presented one idea okay. and then they approved it or, and in one case they asked for a little tweak. Great. So most of these went through uh, no problems. Like um, that illustration is pretty much as is, so. Good. Um, I also do editorial illustrations, and this is a painting of Robert Johnson, uh, the blues musician uh, at the crossroads. This is supposed to be the devil right here underneath that tree, so I wanted him to have something like a flowing robe. So uh, This is a portrait of sci-fi author Ursula Le Guin, and it's for an interview with her that they did uh, concerning her childhood growing up in Berkeley. So, uh, the, hence the little girl, because it talks at length about um, her, uh, it's a fascinating interview actually, she talks about how um, kids today, these days, they're so stimulated, so therefore they don't uh, get that quiet time to actually discover themselves and have to do something to fill that empty time you know, of sheer boredom, and she advocates for the importance of being bored as a child and not having stimulus so that she, you have to discover something that fills up you know, your interests, and she describes it as, a, you know, her walks in, in the hills as a time when she built her soul. Hmm. So I, I thought it was fascinating, and uh, I wanted to do an appropriate illustration for that. This is a, uh, another illustration completely off topic from the last one about uh, possible scenarios of the apocalypse in my hometown of Toronto, and, and their likelihoods of coming true. A uh, giant asteroid apparently came in at like 17 or 16 percent, whereas a uh, giant robot here only came in at 3.5 percent, I think, <laughs> which tells me they didn't know about my robot, you know? Uh, but uh, To say nothing of the mayor. Yes, yes. Uh, this was done before the, what we call the Rob Ford catastrophe of Toronto and the likelihood of that kept coming true was 100%. <laughs> so he would have just dominated. I would love to have drawn him as the giant robot, you know, so. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a concept illustration I did for a film project that was never made, but it was, uh, I was contacted by the director of a very uh, esteemed illustrator, R.O. Blackman, who contacted me and asked me if I would do the designs and the, um, the look, I guess he wanted me to be the art designer for this production, and it's an ad adaptation of a book, um, A Cool Million, which is set in the 30s. And uh, 
and it's written by um, the fellow who wrote um, Day of the Locust, the name is escaping me now. Uh, Nathaniel West. Okay, yeah, Nathaniel, Nathaniel West, West. Thank yes, thank you, you. Yes. for the literate crowd, thank you. Uh, I'm a comic. Miss Lonely Heart. <laughs> And uh, I had to do some research, obviously, for a month on, uh, in, on the 30s and make sure that the movie titles were appropriate for that era. This is another illustration for the film that I did as concept art. I had to take key scenes from the script and I could pick them and then uh, uh, come up with uh, artwork to sell to uh, backers in order to get funding for the project. But I also do personal works for myself, and this is a drawing of uh, my neighborhoods in Toronto. Um, I started drawing these backgrounds, what I call backgrounds. Um, they're landscapes of Toronto, because when I came out of school as an illustrator, I couldn't draw uh, buildings at all. I didn't actually know perspective, which uh, if there's artists in this room, they're gonna go, oh, you fool, you know? <laughs> so, um, and I had to teach myself. So, I was always a fan of landscape painting, and uh, I loved like you know uh, like uh, impressionist works or Turner. But I didn't live in a pastoral setting, so I couldn't really draw anything pastoral or connect with them. So uh, I, because I was a city kid, so I was always trying to find a way to get that same sensibility across by drawing cities, of which these are examples of. So this is a neighborhood in Toronto, and so for about five years, I went around uh, neighborhoods in Toronto. Sometimes I set up a stool and sat there and did some drawings on the spot. Sometimes, like when it's super cold, I took photographs because you'd be <laughs> stupid to try and sit there. And I've actually done this. Uh, I actually tried to sit there one time and draw with like fingerless gloves in a, in a neighborhood. And how long did that take? Uh, no, I gave up after about 45 minutes. Fuck this. Mm -mm. You know? <laughs> so, so uh, that does happen. And they were all collected up a few years ago into a book called Back Alleys and Urban Landscapes uh, that was put out by Drawn and Quarterly. And it features about, I don't know, 60 or so illustrations of my neighborhoods in Toronto. Um, and I would have to say about this book, like if I was describing this to somebody over the phone, it would sound like the most boring, dull, stupid thing. You Thank you, Chip. <laughs> but the reality of it is so the opposite of that. It's really quite extraordinary. It's almost like you set up for yourself um, this, this, this challenge of, you know, it's like anyone can do a pretty great drawing of the Chrysler building, but that's a whole other story. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. It's really, really quite something. And you know, that's the weird thing about being an artist, though, is that you sit there and you draw and go like, I think it's beautiful, so I, I'm sure somebody else will, but you're right, I don't even consider whether or not, yeah, would anyone even consider looking at a book about drawings of alleyways, you know? <laughs> so, it never goes through my head. It just, you know, that's just the way I, I guess I operate, so. As I mentioned, though, I have had a lifelong love of comics, so I've always worked in and tried to work on more comics. But the comics I do have showed up in the oddest of places. Like, um, uh, this is a story called Nighttime that appeared uh, in a literary magazine back home in Toronto as the comic feature. This is the last uh, page of the story. And it was like a four-page story that I did about um, kids who were about 12 who sneak out of their house to run around at night. And, and what they discover along the way, which you know is the mystery of being out on your own at night uh, for the first time, and the romance of that. And this is a, another story that I did for the same literary magazine, which was later reprinted in that Best American Comics collection. And this is a page from it, which is, uh, the story deals with um, the creation of the first atomic bomb, and is also a biography of Robert Oppenheimer. So while that last story was about four pages, this one clocks in at 16, uh, and then this is another story I did about um, the hell of Canadian suburbs and growing up as a teen in them. And this was done in, uh, in, for a now defunct uh, web, uh, web comics collective in Canada. And this one clocks in at 30 pages. So they are getting progressively bigger. So I was sort of learning my craft and trying to hone my storytelling skills and eventually working toward doing something bigger uh, each time. 
But I've also indulged my childhood love of superheroes uh, in this story, which is the one that Chip was talking about, which Chip was so gracious enough to uh, contact me for. Uh, I, at the time, I did not know that you were the world expert on Batman. <laughs> so, uh, and he wrote a fantastic story. The only thing missing from it, I've told him, is, uh, is a birthday party. You know, Which is the, one of the weirdest things on, to say, who has a... I, I've drawn a, a superhero party I, in, uh, in, a, in a Batman story. I've right? drawn a superhero. The, the other, one of the other stories I did for Marvel was set in the 60s, and it was a birthday party that featured all the superheroes, and it was a surprise birthday. And I, when I got it, I said, this is exactly what I want to draw, something positive and fun. <laughs> it had a, a flying dog that was licking the Hulk, you know, and it was, I got to, and, and you're straight. That's the amazing <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. At the end, uh, the superhero uh, blows out the candles, but he blows out with such super breath that all the cake lands on Johnny Storm, putting him out of his fire, and, and then Spider-Man <laughs> takes pictures. It's written by Paul Tobin, who was a fantastic writer. And when he gave me the script, I told him, thank you, I get to draw the birthday party that I always went. Check that off the list. I, I won't repeat what I just said. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but this one is a, a really fun one because it's, it, it's again, another positive, fun story with superheroes, uh, you know, and, and it allowed me to get uh, the Batman thing off my bucket list. <laughs> and uh, I, I've also painted covers uh, for DC. Uh, this is a cover featuring Superboy uh, for a collection of stories set uh, that was a reprint of all the Superboy stories from the 1940s. And again, I wanted to do something that was fun and also featured the, um, what, do they, what do they call that, the Red wag, red Rider, or is it the? the radio Flyer. Mm. Radio Flyer, thank radio you. Flyer. Yeah, 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 featuring that wagon, and because I thought it just quintessentially the 40s. I also wanted to throw a dog in there because I fi figured, you know, yeah, it's my opportunity to get all that childhood stuff in there, you know? <laughs> Lovable ragamuffin, you know? <laughs> cool girl, and cute dog, Superboy, and Radio Flyer, right? <laughs> So, similar thing here, Superboy grows up and then starts fighting giant robots on this cover. So, you can see the, uh, the giant robot influence still seeps in through the uh, subconscious. And there is nothing cooler than Superman fighting giant robots, right? I mean, yes, yeah, of course. You know, except Superman at a birthday party. <laughs> so. Weird, man. <laughs> so, weird, weird, all weird. of this, all of this uh, leads to shoplifter. <laughs> of course it does. <laughs> In a roundabout way. Go with it. <laughs> Which is my first graphic novel. Uh, as I said, I've worked on shorter stories uh, with the aim of gradually building up to doing something longer. And uh, shoplifter was originally envisioned as one of five fairly sizable short stories in a big graphic novel. But in the writing of each of these stories, uh, they grew bigger and bigger, and then in the drawing of them, they grew bigger until I realized that um, it w each story worked best as a book on its own. So it is the first of five interrelated graphic novels, uh, and it's out now. So to discuss this book a little bit, uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about the characters in the book, uh, the first one being Corina Park. And Corina Park is the protagonist of the story, and she is a woman in her mid-twenties. She graduated from uh, college with, the, with an English lit degree with the aim of becoming a novelist, but uh, she now works at, at a large ad agency writing copy. And five years after her graduated life, she finds that this is all she's done. She hasn't written anything, and that she's uh, stuck in a situation somewhat that is comfortable enough for her not to want to leave. And Karina is like a lot of people I knew in their 20s, myself included, who are experiencing that gap between what, they, what their daily life is like and what their idealized life that they wanted to lead is like. And uh, you know, there's a period in, in my 20s and I, see it, I saw it in other people where um, after you've left the confines of the school structure where you have signs telling you what class to go to next from kindergarten upward, uh, you are suddenly uh, abandoned out into the real world and you expect your life to start right away and you would be living the glamorous life that you thought you would be, but you find that at this point you have to find it for yourself and you don't know where the next signpost really is. 
I tend to describe Corina as, um, and the story itself as the story of uh, anybody who is uh, smart enough and sharp enough and well-read and well-educated enough to critique, but for whatever reason is trapped and unable to create, which is a predicament, Lord knows, I've seen many a time, myself included, in, in my 20s. Uh, Corina takes out her frustrations in what, in, in an act that basically makes up the title of the book, uh, and she likes to shoplift uh, as a way to take out her frustrations and her anxieties. Uh, she only shoplifts magazines uh, and only from a large, what she considers large corporate stores. She has a really interesting system of how to do it, which is spelled out step by step inside the book, but please don't shoplift because that's bad. And uh, please don't shoplift the book because then Chip will kill me. Uh, and uh, so she does this uh, as a way to test herself and to, as a test of confidence and also to give herself a little rush that makes her feel alive. But it is a particularly toothless kind of rebellion. And uh, she's uh, aware of that. And Corina is smart enough to realize that she is in a position of privilege and that other people would kill to be in her shoes. Another character in the story is Anais, which is her surly, surly cat, which is based on a friend of mine's cat. Uh, <laughs> There are people I know, I'm allergic to cats, so I have no affinity for them, but there are, I know people who've told me they have cats that hate them. So uh, <laughs> I know the cat in here who hates Corina, but uh, lives with her. And uh, Anais is something like Corina in that, uh, she, Corina took her in from the SPCA, but Anais is trapped in a situation she didn't ask for, but it's just comfortable enough for her not to leave. <laughs> So, Sounds familiar. Yeah, hence the glare when she gets her cat food, and yet she still eats it. Uh, but being a cat, she doesn't shoplift to take out her anxieties, because uh, how could you as a cat, and what would you steal, you know? So uh, instead, what she does is she likes to sneak up on Corina while she's sleeping and then scare the hell out of her. Uh, <laughs> You know, as some cats, I knew a friend who ha told me I often wake in the middle of the night and my cat is sitting on my chest glaring at me with, <laughs> with hate, you know, and I thought, why do you have a cat? Because uh, I'm allergic and I don't have cats. Uh, this is a panel of NAs doing that, as is this, and this. So this occurs a lot. Well, it's uh, not necessarily hate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's an expression of feline power, I guess. Uh, by the way, I have no ability to draw cats, so, uh, because I'm allergic, and cats are on my top five list of things I cannot draw. And so uh, when I wrote this story, uh, as a writer, when I write stories, I don't think about whether or not I can draw them. I just write it as a writer. And, uh, and that way I don't limit myself and edit out things because, just because I think it's gonna be difficult to draw. I just write it, uh, whatever needs to be written, and then when I sit down and put on my artist cap, I curse myself out for writing a cat into the damn story. And I got to the page where she makes her debut and I, had to, I was on a roll and I had to put down my pencils and go, shit, I don't know how to draw cats. Okay, I'm gonna watch a lot of YouTube videos and, uh, and sketch cats for four days. And I did this. Uh, there's a lot of cats with like toast on their heads in, on YouTube. You're you know? kidding. Yeah. My daughter watched a lot of them with me and she had a lot of fun, but she just heard me cursing myself for drawing cats. And my wife is an artist, uh, a very accomplished one, and I would show her my cat drawings and she would say, that is a very nice miniature tiger you drew. So uh, it took a little while for me to get the hang of it. And at one point, my daughter is sitting there in my studio with me while I'm drawing cats and she's hearing me moan about it. And she goes, Daddy, what's wrong? And I said, can't draw a cat, Punkin, and she goes, oh, daddy, cats are easy. Look, you do this. You draw a circle, then you draw a sausage, and then you draw four other little sausages, and then you put some squiggles on, there's a cat. And I said, that's perfect, and I still have that drawing on my wall. 
The next day she went to the library and she took out a bunch of books and excitedly brought them home and uh, she showed me and she said, I have brought a Dora the Explorer book and I have a, a Tinkerbell adventure and here's a book for you, Daddy. It's How to Draw Cats. <laughs> so, uh, and well, I, isn't she a little know-it-all? <laughs> That would be considered being a smart art director, maybe, or something, I don't know. So, <clears throat> anyway, back from that digression, uh, needless to say, Anais and Corina have a complicated and awkward relationship. Another person that uh, Corina has an awkward relationship with is her boss, Rodney. And Rodney is the head of the advertising agency that Corina works at, and he is a very successful uh, executive. Uh, at the start of the story, when we meet him, he's come back from an awards dinner in New York, and uh, we get to see the award that he won, which is this thing right here. Uh, if you're sharp-eyed and if I've drawn it properly, it's got a little picture of Gandhi as the, <laughs> the embedded uh, picture. I did not make this up. This is actually based on a true advertising award that exists that a friend of mine uh, told me about. He texted me from the event and said, uh, because he works in advertising, he said, dude, they are giving an award out that has a picture of Gandhi on it. And I... Well, Gandhi was the Saatchi of... <laughs> of Indian revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why you're the editor. <laughs> so... so uh, I texted him back immediately and said, so what's... Did the, what did they win for? And he said, uh, they won for best titling effect. And uh, I said, oh, I gotta put this in a story someday. And, and then I got a chance to, so I was very happy to. And then on this side, you could see uh, a Henry Moore maquette. Uh, so it shows that uh, Rodney is uh, very successful at what he does. And, oh yes, he is. And like most successful people, uh, who are very, very successful, obviously, um, he believes wholeheartedly in what he does. I think that is a critical element of being very successful. So he believes in the worth of what he does, he believes in his mission, and uh, he believes it to be a calling that is uh, likened to art. And here he quotes uh, Khalil Gibran, uh, the prophet, and he goes, uh, the work, work is love made visible. That's a quote from Khalil Gibran. He wrote a magnificent book, The Prophet. Have you read it? And, uh, Karina's response is similar to most people who get quoted Gibran and the Prophet from an advertising executive, mm -hmm. and they have an exchange for a bit because Karina is somewhat filled with doubt. But Rodney, like I say, has the conviction in what he does, and here he says, um, the best of us, we are like great artists. We are searching inside and giving something vulnerable and precious of ourselves to move the viewer, which and is... Remind me what that painting is behind him. Oh yeah, it's an, it's an Alex Katz painting, who, which I thought was a nice little thing because he sits somewhat at the intersection between the two. Uh, Corina's response to that is, you know, obvious here, which leads to the central conflict and the question of the story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another character in the story, in a way, is the city itself, and uh, I love drawing cities, and I wanted the city in this story to be unnamed, so that it would represent any big city that a creative person moves to, with the aim of uh, fulfilling their, their, their dreams and, and blossoming into the person they want to be. Uh, and uh, the city in the story is presented, while it's unnamed, I wanted to have recognizable details that you know, that people could latch onto and feel that it is alive rather than be just a background. So it contains things like the ubiquitous presence of advertising everywhere you go, whether it's on the streets or in a subway car, uh, in giant light up billboards and, uh, and screens uptown or in plastered handbills downtown. It surrounds you everywhere. Also, uh, like in every big city or everywhere these days, everybody's on their phones and they are all tweeting or checking Facebook. Although nobody checks Facebook as much anymore, right? It's all on Twitter or, what's the new thing, Ello? All right, I don't know. You, okay, I'm, I just dated you. 
I, I, I don't really know. Uh, They're checking th there's a messages. new app called Scrotum, but I haven't Scr checked it out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, carrying on. <laughs> How do you segue from scrotum? How do you segue from that? You're, you're, you guys are going to check that out. Right? <laughs> totally made it up. All right. So, I find cities to be. Uh, oh, now, 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 now. I'm sorry. I'm just I ruined it. Scrotum. I scrotum. ruined it. Okay. So, it's a beautiful drawing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I find cities to be fascinating places. Uh, I have a love of drawing them, obviously, and uh, I wanted to present some of the different views of a city in the this, in this story. Um, cities can be very wide open and expansive places, you know, when you're coming to them, especially for the first time, especially when you're moving at a certain age in your life with the, uh, to a big city from a small town. Uh, they can be very, you know, hopeful places, or they can be alienating, somewhat distant places or somewhere in between with uh, a kind of melancholy beauty all on their own. And I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, so I just want to thank you all again for coming out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Scrotum. <laughs> no. Um, how old were you when you moved from South Korea to Toronto? Uh, I moved to a town outside of Toronto, but I was about uh, six years old. And what was your impression of, of, of doing that? How, how, did, how did your life change? Um, well, I was so young, I couldn't even begin to answer that question. Um, you know, at six, you're not even self-aware, so uh, I just knew that we were moving. Um, the biggest, I suppose the biggest takeaway from that, that I, if I've thought about it at all, is that um, I have an outsider's perspective because I was an immigrant to, the, to Canada, so, um, I've always been able to see the, uh, you know, an, an opposite side to an issue because I've always stood apart because when I came here I didn't speak the language and so I, I wasn't a native to this culture. Uh, and so, you know, I, I identify with the outsider. So then, okay, at what point did you move from a small town to Toronto? Uh, when I was going to art college. And where'd you go to art college? Uh, uh, in the art college of, uh, the Ontario College of Art, before, it's called OCAD now because they added a D for design. I went there before they added the D, so it was just OCA at the time. How did that change the way you thought about your environment? Uh, it changed it immensely. Uh, I grew up in a steel town that's just outside of Toronto, and um, being an art artistic or a creative person wasn't really um, a thing that was pursued in that town. I didn't have many friends who drew or read the books that I read, and um, I, you know, I felt like an outsider all through my childhood. And then uh, when I came to Toronto and went to art college, I, I was floored by the fact that there were a whole college of people who I could get along with that thought like me, that you know, had books to recommend to me, that you know, and vice versa, and we could have discussions about art and not hockey. You know, so, <laughs> so, I, so I don't know the rules of hockey actually. So, so you felt like you got a, a good education. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I took no illustration or comics. They didn't have a comics program back then. I took um, contemporary art, which was doing like um, installation type work or um, large paintings, uh, performance stuff. And uh, while none of that uh, technical skill has translated into what I do now, the conceptual thinking part of it uh, has translated immensely because uh, even still when I get an illustration assignment or when I'm working on an artistic uh, project of any kind, um, that critical thinking uh, that I was trained in art college kicks in and you know my first response is to um, question it from first principles. What is this? What am I trying to express? You know, rather than how do I make this guy look better or you know, turn the form this way or make sure that the snow is drawn properly. This way I'm always questioning, you know, what is the purpose of this thing? Do you know if they teach comics there now? 
Um, I don't think they have a comics program. Um, they might have a critical one, like a gra introduction to graphic novels program. I could be wrong on that. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are other schools in that area that do that. There is another school in, that, uh, in Ontario, Sheridan, where they have um, an illustration. It's more of a technical background. They have illustration and animation. And I have friends who went to that school who came from an animation background or an illustration background. And then I have friends who come from uh, from OCAD who came from a more critical theory background and it's interesting to see the differences in thought process. Um, you work mostly in two color and um, from what we've talked about before, you prefer that to, to full or four color and, and why is that? Um, well, first of all, I never feel limited working in a limited color palette. Uh, it would seem you know, strange that way, but I actually feel I get more out of it than I would in a full color palette. And a part of that is because um, I don't have to worry about the expectations that come with doing something in full color. And I don't have to juggle colors and worry about um, how the color harmonies affect the scene. I give this example, which is um, I'm, if I'm trying to draw a, a sad cat in front of, uh, and it's, you know, and I'm trying to express the fact that this cat is forlorn or something, and it's in front of uh, a giant bright yellow wall. And if it was in full color, I'm sitting there going, how do I make this yellow look, you know, fit the, the emotional tone of the scene? But if I don't have to worry about that, then I can express it through light and, uh, and it works out better. Or, you know, if someone's in a cacophonous, loud color space, and we've already established that in previous shots that there's multicolored balloons, how do I do the same effect there? You know, I don't, if I don't have to juggle full colors and instead are limited to only one color or two, it's much easier for me to control that and focus on what I'm interested in, which is the emotional uh, and atmospheric and, and, and mood aspects of a scene. Um, just one more question, then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, you work in a style that um, has been described as lost line. Um, so can you just talk a little bit uh, about that and the way that works? Um, yeah, uh, what I do is, and especially in this book, I work in a few different modes depending on what the project is obviously, but um, in this book and from a lot of my work that, that is known is that I, I, I work in a style that doesn't use many outlines. A lot of traditional comics is drawn with a big fat outline around the figure and, um, and that's a holdover from the old way of where comics printing was so bad that you had to draw a big fat containing line in case the registration of colors was off and such. But um, for me, that, the outline is not a factor at all. It's not something I think about. What I, intend, what I instead think about is mostly light. And I think about how light defines forms and how uh, light creates atmosphere and, and creates mood. So uh, whenever I draw a line, I find that what I'm, what I'm trying to do when I, when I put down a line is really, I am not drawing a line, I am drawing the shadow that is cast by the light. So that's the way I tend to approach the artwork. And it's an approach that I learned from um, 40s and 30s adventure cartoonists. One of my uh, favorite artists is uh, a, an illustrator named Noel Sickles, who did adventure comics in the 30s. Uh, he only worked in comics for like four years, but he influenced an entire generation of, of artists. And he had a beautiful, he was talented enough that he could work in multiple styles, but at one point he hit a really sweet spot where uh, he did an impressionistic black and white rendering where there were no lines, it was just, he was just putting down shadows. And uh, because he got the shadows dead right, the form's still red, but they had a quality of light to them. And, and it gave the shots, uh, the scenes, so much more atmosphere. And then another illustrator uh, and cartoonist I know is, that I love is Roy Crane, who was another cartoonist from that era. And his work was similar, only a little more precise, and he added a half tone. So he would put in uh, little gray dots, you know, using um, a half tone. Uh, he used to use craft tint board, and uh, it dawned on me that uh, if I did the same thing, but instead of using the half tone, I would put in a color, I could get the same effect, you know. And so that's really where that comes from, along with other artists like um, Frank Robbins is another great example of, from the '40s. Um, we don't have a, a ton more time here, but uh, we're happy to take questions from the audience if there are any at, at this point. We have 
Microphones on either side. Or you can just scream your head off. Okay. Um, I have two questions, and if you'd like to choose one over the other, that's fine. <laughs> um, first one is, you mentioned um, there were four or five things that you felt you couldn't draw, cats being one of them. I wondered if you'd want to say what the others were. And the other question is, how did you pick pink as the second color, <laughs> and, and why that particular pink, or how did you come to pink? I can do both. Uh, first question, uh, horses, cats, uh, shopping malls, and movie theaters. These are, this is like the kryptonite. Uh, horses are impossible to draw because their legs move really weird. Uh, cats, obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, shopping malls because they're just straight lines and signage and crowds. And uh, movie theaters, similar to this, uh, lots of perspective lines and crowds. You know, so crowds are interesting to draw, but not in a line with lots of chairs that have to be perfectly aligned between each other. So, and then the second one was pink, right? Uh, why pink? Was um, a lot of people who do uh, two tone artwork at the time when I was thinking about this book were doing uh, two tone artwork with um, like a blue or a teal or a turquoise or maybe an orange as the color. And I saw a lot of books like that and I thought, I want to do something that's completely different from those. And so I, I thought I would work with pink. And it's not really a pink, it's like a salmon color. But um, uh, when I started drawing with it, I realized that, oh, this works great because um, it fits the intimate tone of the story while at the same time adds uh, a bit more liveliness so it, doesn't pre it prevents it from getting morose in a way. So it just fit. Next question. Hi. Um, this question actually, I guess, applies for both of you, um, or perhaps part of it more for Michael. Um, I'm curious whether there is a book that for which you would love to design a cover um, that you haven't yet done, and hmm. uh, at least for Michael, whether there's one that you are interested in adapting. You want? Uh, well, um, hmm. I've been extremely lucky uh, in that. Um, I've been able to design many covers for many books. I think one of the ironies is um, I, I've worked at Knopf Publishing for a long time, and um, next week I, I will mark my 28th anniversary there. Um, there's two authors that we publish who um, I would love to design the book covers for, but there's a way we have the whole department set up so that they have other designers that work for them, and, and that um, is Lori Moore and Alice Monroe. Um, mm. And um, I just don't know if that's ever going to happen. But um, I would, I'm just glad we published their work, because I, I just think they're so brilliant and wonderful. But um, whether I'll ever get to actually design for them, we'll have to see. I always uh, want to do an adaptation of Hamlet. Uh, and uh, I wanted to do it straight up uh, and, and not, like, but the problem with it is that um, there's a lot of manga ad adaptations of Hamlet these days and for like YA readers or really? reluctant readers, yeah, so therefore I, I wouldn't want to flood it with that, you know, because it's, you'd be competing against that. But I, one of these days, I always say when I'm 50 or so, I'm going to do like the 700 page uh, adaptation of Hamlet the way I saw it because it's my favorite play, but I've only, I've never actually seen a uh, version on stage or on screen that fit what I saw in my head. So, really? Yeah. Well, we'll just have to talk about that. <laughs> Next question, back here. Hey guys, how you doing? Good. Hey. Um, I'm more of a film guy myself, and um, we're essentially living in the, the past 15, 20 years, the era of the comic book film, and uh, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on um, you know, when you see one of your 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 favorite comics growing up turn into a, a big motion picture, as they've been with the X Men and um, you know Spider Man, all of those, um, if you think um, they sort of relate from you know going from the pen and paper onto the big screen, and if in the future, Shoplifter, if money wasn't an issue, if you would consider like turning down a a major film role just because it sort of takes away from the credibility of the. Uh, the, the comic feel of it. 
Um, I think the only thing I'll say about that is that um, the New York Times asked me to write a piece about Robert Downey Jr. like five years ago. Um, and basic, I used it as a platform to say that to me, the first Iron Man movie um, is, and I don't know if this answers your question, but it's, it's really to me one of the best movies about um, design problem solving that I've ever seen. Like the only thing that comes close to it is Tucker by Francis Ford Coppola. And, and where he's in this situation where he's, you know, he is fucked and he has to design his way out of it. And he does. And it's just, it's just astonishing to me. And I think what, what they were able to do with that movie was basically, you know, okay, it's, it, it's Iron Man, but okay, civilian population of the rest of the world. Uh, he, here is why this character was so interesting. And, and, and in the original comic, he had to design his way out of Vietnam. And, and in the movie, he has to design his way out of the Middle East. And, and it's, it's just incredible, incredible. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I think that's just such a complete and total triumph, whether, and, and yes, of course, it was at the box office too, but uh, just, as as a as a as a fan and and as of somebody who wants to see that process on screen, I thought it was an absolute complete uh, triumph and inspiration. Yeah, I liked Iron Man too, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, for me, like I like it. <coughs> if we're talking about superhero movies, I'm I'm all for them when they're like they take those characters and they make a a, a fresh movie out of it. You know, uh, like the Iron Man movie, while it incorporates a little bit of his rich origin story in Vietnam and they updated for uh, Afghanistan, it's pretty much a fresh take on it. But uh, when they do an adaptation of, of like uh, of a comic, uh, particularly a beloved comic, particularly a beloved comic from the 80s featuring iconic heroes in a 12 page or 12 issue miniseries that was, you know, a childhood favorite of mine, uh, <laughs> you know, with a happy face on the cover. But uh, when they do things like that, I, I often say, I don't want to see uh, my, why do you feel the need to have, to validate great comics by making mediocre movies out of them? You know, that's yeah, no, no, I totally agree, and no, I do because I mean I don't know. You, he's talking about the Watchmen, and and uh, it was kind of it was it was kind of heartbreaking to watch. Yeah, I I don't like the like uh, I don't like it when they take the source material and then they just they they but they turn to something completely different. I like it when, I, I, for example, we were talking about this, I, I love that new Captain America movie, right? And yeah. it's different yeah. enough from the source material, it's like a hodgepodge, but it works, you know? But when they try to do a, a faithful adaptation of a beloved story, and I sit there and go like, you know, I like the comic, I don't need a $200 million movie out of this thing to appreciate the comic again, you know? So, but, um, that said, I mean, there are some comics that really work well in, as adapted to film, and there's just some that can't, you know? Uh, Watchmen is an example of something that is, I can't imagine it working in two hours, and you know, it didn't for me, so. I would also say that at this point, there's so many comic book adaptations of, to film that, 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 you know, that's a whole, you know, college dissertation. But we spent the afternoon with, with Dan Klaus uh, 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 today, uh, amazingly and happily, and 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 when you think about the degree of um, involvement he had in Ghost World uh, to adapt mm -hmm. it and to really make it into what he thought it should be in another medium is amazing. But that's a completely different thing. Yeah, and to sum that up, um, especially with superhero movies, there's a do you guys know uh, David Mazzucchelli's uh, Batman uh, Year One? You know, okay, in a, in a reprinted edition, he did a little two-page comic about what Batman meant to him and why Batman works. And the last panel of this thing is brilliant because it sums it all up. And he goes, uh, he, throughout it, he's talking about how the more real you make superheroes, the less believable they are. 
you know, and by that he means when you know when they're drawing and they're cartoon, you you accept it. But when you see a guy in a Batman suit, it's a guy in a Batman suit, not <laughs> Batman, you know. And uh, at the end, he says um, something like, uh, "Comic, uh, Batman is real to me. Uh, superheroes are real when they're drawn in ink on paper." You know, and that sort of sums up my thinking about some of these films, is that um, the emphasis in trying to make them realistic just hammers home the, the ridiculousness of that conceit in some ways. Another question back here. Hey, um, you mentioned ink on paper. My, my question is in regards to the actual production of the images, how much is ink on paper and how much is drawn on a computer. And None of it's drawn on the computer. Do you see that he does, the... he does everything ink on paper. Yeah, uh, the only thing that is uh, done digitally was uh, the actual words and the lettering, which is a typeface I made of my own handwriting because I, I wanted to save myself from carpal tunnel. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I work 100% uh, on, on board. I, work, I can work digitally. I do have like a, a Cintiq and I've done corrections that way and I've done whole illustrations that way. But when I do comics, I like doing it on the board. And the tone is on the board on, uh, at the same time as the ink. Next one's up here as well. Do I need to press this right here? No. Uh, Michael, I wonder, wondered if you're familiar with the work of Milt Caniff? Yeah, yeah. Who's oh very God, much yes. like you in some ways, his yeah. superb blacks. And he, he transitioned from this very simple line to, to mm -hmm. the, becoming the Rembrandt of the comic strips, as he was known. I didn't, I got here late, I didn't see, I wonder if in your early work, if, you were, if it was very different from how it is now, and if you move toward this wonderful, lineless work you have. Yeah, uh, and you know, uh, Caniff is, um, he, he learned that technique from Noel Sickles who was one of his best friends who was doing a, another strip at the time called uh, Scorchy Smith. And, uh, and they were like studio mates and everything. And Kniff was like, how do you do this? And he was like, I'll show you. And, and then he ghosted uh, for Kniff a few times and they were lifelong friends. They did a, a, an abandoned Bruce Lee strip in the 70s, which is an amazing artifact. Like I was like, two old guys in the 1970s sat down to try and pitch a newspaper Bruce Lee strip. Which is, Unbelievable, you know. I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan, so I know this. But um, they, they, Kniff is an influence on me less so than uh, than Sickles, who taught him. But you know, it, it's that same school. And um, your other question was what what my work was like way in the past. If you'd gone from Kniff into this yeah, it's a natural progression. Um, when I like. It, 15 years ago, I didn't draw like this, but uh, I don't know if I'm gonna draw like this in 15 years. I don't, I don't consider it like I reached this point, I'm gonna stay here. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out and follow my muse and what uh, interests me is what I'll follow. Do we have more questions? We can probably get to all of them. I'll make Siri run around. <laughs> hey, um, thank you for uh, talking, this was great. Um, you talked about spe like pausing working on the comic to spend four days studying cats, and I was wondering if that happens often, and if like like how what's like the longest rabbit hole you've gone down with something like that? Uh, mm, sometimes I have a design problem, like uh, I'm I'm drawing something, and then I realize, okay, wait. In order for this to be convincing, I have to sit and draw uh, a blueprint of the apartment and figure out what it looks like from different angles. Because in comics, it's not like an illustration where you just get one-offs. You, you, know, you just do a drawing once. But in comics, if you draw someone's apartment and it shows up in another scene, you have to figure out what it looks like from a different angle or figure out how to draw the furniture again so, to make it consistent. So I run into things like that. But four days to draw a cat was the big one. That's, you know. <laughs> Literally four days. I, I even posted some of the sketches on Twitter and it was just like, they were just the awfulest sketches. You know? <laughs> There's one that like, has a cat going, why me, Mike, why me? <laughs> yeah. Do we have any other questions? Don't be shy, here we go. Since um, a lot of your artwork implies that it was almost a print, do in, does any of your artwork ever end up printed as a piece of fine art, as a print? 
Yeah, uh, I, I learned silk screening as, um, as a student as well, and uh, I am somewhat influenced by that technique, so uh, I do make prints occasionally. I, like A lot of my drawings of Toronto have ended up in prints, and um, occasionally, like if I'm at a Comic-Con, I will take along some prints of Batman or something that I make, so. Another question? Hi, how are you? Yes. <laughs> Good to see you, Chip. Mr. Henrik. Right. Um, since you've introduced us to one version of the five, what are the other five titles that you're going to do? Um, without giving away everything, uh, I can give you like short synopses of the stories, is, or no? No. Okay. <laughs> so never mind. Never mind. I'll just tell you some Can't broad themes. Hey. Broad themes, or what? What do I do? The, well, no. But the, they are all. The five stories are interrelated. They don't feature the same characters. The next story is set in a completely different location. It's set in a coastal town for the most part, and is, uh, features like two characters. It's a pseudo-romance story with other elements. Uh, it has no cats, uh, at least uh, and no horses. It does have boats and water, which is another toughie. But, um, and all five stories interrelate uh, in a way that is not obvious at first. So as you get further... Well, and then at the end it will be. Yes, now you... you, you well, you, you, all right, but that's all right. Okay, okay, that's yeah, not saying yes, anything. Yes. They all feature different characters, some and characters... And Rosebud is a sled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Luke, I am your fucking father. <laughs> all right, so... Um, <laughs> We're just going to wrap up here real quick. It's not fucking working. Michael Cho. Jordan over there asked for a special beatbox presentation. Michael and Chip will be uh, joining us in the atrium for reception. I hope you'll all come and buy books and have them signed, have some tea, maybe a cookie. Thank you Thank again. you so much for coming out. Thank You've you. You've been a great audience.